I... To whom? Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>
have a, a shared vision of inspiring meaningful social change. What what does that what does that social change look like to you? What does it look like to you? To you? We, I'll go first. Uh, to me, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about our initiative that our players really created and that we support our players with in trying to, what we use the term, inspire change. And to work with them on criminal justice, education, uh, better relationships with law enforcement and the communities. Those types of things that our players have identified in areas we need to make progress on, we need to move forward on. And that's, we'll be supporting that inspire change as probably well as evolving that with our players. I mean, I, that, that, that's something that's gonna evolve very quickly, I think. Jason. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, something like this doesn't come together unless you two have a lot of really candid discussions about what this is about. Can you talk a little bit about how your relationship has evolved over this process, over these months? I would take that you guys said, hey, let's talk about talk about this. I think uh, just really truthful, honest conversation. I think the first thing I said to Roger was, if this is about me performing in the Super Bowl, then we could just end this conversation now. It has to be a bigger platform than that. That we, was after I flew from New York to L.A. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good weather, though, man. <laughs> Jay, 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 how many months ago, how many, how many months has this taken place, these conversations? Uh, I don't know. When, when was the... I don't... We first, uh, I think, first saw each other at the Kansas City Rams game, and then I think I came out in early January. Yeah, so six, seven months. Yeah, somewhere yeah. in that area. Just the relationship, how it's developed. Well, I, you know, I'd also uh, give a, a, a call out to Robert Kraft, too, who had a relationship, too, with Jay, and uh, he saw the benefit of this also. And so he actually joined us in our first meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, I would tell you that it, it was a lot of very frank conversation. Um, we talked about a lot of the issues. Uh, we also talked about what we could actually do and bringing football and music and entertainment together and then having an impact on our communities was something we both wanted to do. But, um, you know, relationships build over time and trust, but they also, I think we're both committed to sort of saying, let's get to work. Let's go show people that this is going to be a great thing. I want to take it to this side back. My question would be, um, what would you say to those kind of people that would say that they, you, this is sort of effectively a move to kind of take the protests uh, away from the field to a platform that might be a little bit more palatable to the league and a little, you know, less out and visible. Would, would you kind of still support protests on the field? Do you feel like this is kind of moving it away from um, putting it out there in, on the field in front of a, a mass audience? I support any protest that's effective, you know, and if you can provide effective ways to push a conversation forward and help people at the same time, that. I'm really into action. You know, I'm really into like real work. I'm not into like uh, how it looks. You know, how it looks only lasts for a couple months until we really start doing the work. And everybody, oh, I've been in this position many times where people before I even say what I'm about to do have told me what I'm thinking or how it's going to turn out. And then at five years later, you know, we look back at this. Take title is a great example for take that five years ago, and now you look at it today, and people have a different outlook on it. But at the time, it was like, what's going on? So I've been in this position many times, and you know, I just show up and do the work. I'm not really interested in how things look on the outside, and if if protesting on the field is the most effective way, then protest on the field. If, but. If you have a vehicle like Inspire Change where you can speak to the masses and educate at the same time as well, tell people what's going on so people are not controlling your narrative and not telling you your protest is about this. You're like, no, I'm telling you out of my mouth it's about this one thing. You know, but if you have a platform that's reaching millions of people, it's hard to, it's hard to steer the narrative the way, the way they want to. And I just add one thing to that. I think what the players want is to focus on the work in the communities that they're doing and the problems in addressing them. They, they, they did the protest to bring attention to that. Now they want to get to the hard work of helping make progress in those communities. And so that's where they want the attention. That, that's what they want to see is the work that we're all doing together to try to make our communities better. And they're leading. Do you want the protest to stop? 
I want us to take the, what they've been talking about and the focus of what they're protesting, protesting about to go make a change in the communities because that's what they wanted. That's what they were doing. Have you, Jay-Z, have you spoken with Cap? If so, what was the conversation? If not, why not? I would never tell you what uh, me and Cap's private conversation was about, but we spoke, yeah. And is he supportive? I would never tell you about our conversation. <laughs> 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 And if people still choose to take a knee or protest during the anthem, um, will this vehicle be used as a discouragement? Might you say, well, why do that any longer when we set up this whole new vehicle to inspire change? But you can also ask that question, if this vehicle be used as an encouragement? No, I got you. I, I, yeah. I, well, obviously it can be, no. but I'm just saying some people... No, I just wanted to open that up for you. No, I, I agree with you. <laughs> but, but we know, let's, let's be honest, with everything yeah. we're dealing with... And I'm with, only honest. And, and even what we're dealing with right now, the, I doubt that the, the, the rate of speed by which inspired change can make a difference is going to catch up to a lot of stuff that's happening today. We still have police killings happening every single day. We have people being killed by domestic terrorism. I mean, we're not going to solve all this in the 2019-2020 season. So, yeah, but don't you want to get started? Well, no, let's get started. What I'm saying is, in the interim, people are going to want to say, I may want to take a knee, or I may want to make a statement. But that's about what, this outside that's of what this. our Inspire Change platform is, to continue to show what's going on in those communities and what we can do to try to help it and what our players are doing to make the change. And that's what, that's what we're doing. And that's why we continue to work with our Players Association, the Players Coalition, to try to say, we're not, we're not walking away from that. We're actually putting more research in. We're bringing more partners to, to bring uh, not only awareness, but change. Can you just speak about the role that Robert Kraft played in brokering this deal? Yeah, I think, I, again, I think that we, through our work uh, with prison reform, and uh, um, I think he saw how serious we were in the room, and we've had a relationship before we basically talked actually no one mentions with all due respect no one mentions adam levine in this whole thing and his role that he played in this you know we all talk about cap because that's you know that's a hot button issue but you know this is an entertainment company as well we also discuss what happened what happened to super bowl right because that was one of the things that sparked this conversation as well what happened at the super bowl and I explained to them how the process went with the Super Bowl and myself and what I felt about it. Um, we were, again, that frank was, conversation, exactly, super, that, super that clear. We had super frank conversations. And you know, it slowly evolved from there. So how do we fix it? And it's, uh, I sat with Roger, and I was like, man, if this is about me playing the Super Bowl, then we might as well just end this meeting now, because that's, that's, that's not enough. You know, we need to. You guys have a platform, you know, people are upset. You know, private citizens for me, uh, with everything that's going on in the country, private citizens are the one that's gonna have to push things forward, working together like we do with reform. We're not, worrying, we're not relying on government to do it. Okay, let's take this group of people and let's introduce these bills and see what we can do. You know, let's take Team Rock, like, you know, Team Rock organization we started, let's take current events where People are getting in trouble every day, and it's on a news cycle. And let's, let's stop a little boy from getting arrested for singing the national anthem in school. That's a real thing. You know, so uh, that's how the whole thing came about. It was like, let's make it bigger than that. Let's use this platform to really, to really uh, inspire change. And you know, let's put on some great performances. Will and even, performing even the entertainment. Will you be performing as well? I don't, not this year, no. No. But even, uh, just to go to Jay's point, it's, it's even entertainment well beyond the Super Bowl, as you saw from Asia's presentation. We're talking about engaging our players. We're talking about using our events, all our events, the draft, the Super Bowl, the Pro Bowl, the kickoffs, to be able to use this partnership and have it come to life. It's just not Super Bowl. Commissioner? Yeah, that's a good um, point. Commissioner, I know yeah, you and the NFL, and Jay, you and Rob, I'm sure have thought about 
how you'll measure success of this program. Can you give us any insight on what success will look like for this program? I don't have a number. It's not a number. Like with reform, we got a million people, which is a not so number, right? Um, um, I don't have a number, but I'm sure that we'll we'll reevaluate as this thing go 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 along. How many people are we touching? How many people are we reaching? We're we're constantly um, looking at the the you know the metrics and all the numbers of what's happening and who we're touching and who who we're speaking to and who's participating, and how many impressions has it had, and wh how many people that it affected in real time. Like, real, so we'll keep it evaluating that as, as we go along. Yeah. Tiggy, I just add um, to what Jay said, uh, elevate the entertainment too. I mean, we we'll always wanna get better, and we think we can do that. We got the best in the business right here. Uh, so we think we can do that, but the impact is really important. And as I've teased several times, with all this great entertainment, I hope people don't forget that a great football game is going to break out in the middle of it, by the way. I hope, <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> uh, Jay, from a, uh, from a hip hop point of view, you've, uh, I remember you once said to Naj, you try to keep knowledge. And yeah. since then, we've seen you change and evolve. Um, and I think people forget about that to some extent. I remember the, the Water Initiative in Africa, Sean Bell, et cetera, et cetera. How do you um, address people who may have those short-term memory issues, you know, or do you care? I just got to do the work. You know, that's the only thing that, that quiets that, right? Because, you know, we can, we can go back and forth and, and have different uh, perspectives of what we believe should happen, right? This should happen or it should be like this. And, this person should be involved. How could it go forward if this person isn't involved? You know, all these different things that we can uh, talk about and speak about, but no one can argue with the facts. No one can argue with the work. Right. You know, so I just got to do the work. And, and again, it's, 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 I'm familiar with this position. This is, what, this is what I do. Will this initiative create jobs or any other, you know, we talk about inspiring the community, et cetera, et cetera. But what about like jobs? things that people can really touch and feel. I don't know. So you know, also, we're, we're sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. Also in there, you know, there's education and all these other things which will lead to job creation. And anybody that plugs in, say a song of the season, and that's your platform that you want to speak about. Mm -hmm. And we're not only, it's not just uh, our platform, we're plugging into anyone who wants to be involved. So right. say I'm, Chance to rap, and I feel like I want to create jobs in Chicago. We're going to support that initiative. Right. So it could be anything. It could be any initiative, anything social injustice, anything that's happening in the country. We can plug into it. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. I just said I think it's going to be driven a lot by our players and the artists. To some, we're going to continue to listen to them, see what where we can have the greatest impact. Okay. Jeff. Um, hi, Jerry. I'm from Brian. Do you have? A list yet of organizations that you're going to partner with that will benefit from this partnership, and also Jay, do you regard this as this partnership as a form of protest? I mean, are you looking to change things from the inside? Of course, yes. I'll answer that first. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have anything else to add to that. Just yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question then for uh, the me? The question was, do you have a list or have you set things up with non-profit organizations? Yes. We've yeah. already, as a matter of fact, not just a list. We've already started funding uh, for the last uh, two years, which we can give you an entire list of all the organizations that we have done with our players, with our clubs. And that funding began probably 18 months ago. Okay. And we have commitments to do that going in the future. And I think, I think Opportunity is something I'd say that's going to come out of this where I think there'll be additional opportunities and frankly additional money that may come out of this that will go back into the communities because of this. Okay, so there are no new partnerships as of yet as a result of this one? We're not making that announcement today, no, but I, I have no question that that's going to evolve as we continue to talk with the artists and the players. What he's saying, what, what was exciting for us as well is what we're saying is. All those other initiatives uh, Rock Nation drew up and these guys agreed to, which you have to give them credit for that. Uh, Inspire Change already existed. 
they already were donating money. I think it was 1.4 from that, the last the last um, event, but it was so, in my opinion, it was so spread out that it needed to be happening all year long, it, not just happening around a Super Bowl event. It couldn't be like one event a year. It had happened all the time and throughout the whole year. So, things are happening every day. Like we were, we were creating um, uh, philanthropy organizations for our players and realized, no, th things are happening every day. We need a separate, which is Team Rock. This is Donya, I keep pointing to her because she runs it. <laughs> no, we need something that happens every day. That, because there's things happening all over this country, and it's a lot of turmoil. And I think that we all have a responsibility to just push it forward. Like, it's, it's good to have, like, you know, conversations about it. That's great. We have to bring awareness to it. So I'm not knocking the conversation. I actually welcome the conversation. I want to be held to a higher stand. I want to be, I'm not even going to say higher stand. I want, I want to be, um, I, I want to be held accountable for what I'm doing. Right, it keeps me sharp, keeps me sharp. Let me know that I'm, I can't play around. I have to do what I said I'm going to do. I'm self-motivated, so that's fine. With, you know, the extra pressure is fine, too. What I'm saying is um, things are happening all the time, and we are going through a tough time. And the NFL platform for us, what was exciting for us, Spire Change was already happening, and, and uh, the NFL has a huge platform. And we can use that huge platform for We've seen it happen. Like when J.J. Watts, you know, came the, the, the aid to everybody in Houston, the whole world forgot about all the turmoil they had with the NFL. Was, oh, that's a great thing. That's a fantastic thing. And if you can use that platform to do that in different areas, then it's a home run. That's the success. I think someone asked me what I would view success. That's the, that's the success for me. Hi, Randy from ET. Uh, in his presentation, you mentioned that the Super Bowl performance will be picked based on the city and honoring the heritage of that. Can you elaborate on what that means exactly? And have conversations begun, like J Lo and Rico Iglesias? No, not like that. Not 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 in those, in those terms. Like you know, typically when um, and we had this conversation, can't go to a city, plop a, a, a show down, and then leave. You know, like at least speak to the community, speak to the things, speak to the guys that's on the ground um, organizing things and trying to make things better in that sort of way. Because I don't, you know, Tampa's next year. I don't, I have, I love Tampa Bay. I don't have no idea who, who's from there who performed. So you get, you, so you start running into that problem. Um, you know, if you start doing that. And, and sometimes it may happen and it may line up that the person, is from the city that they perform, but you don't want to get into that space because then, again, who's who performs from Tampa? Does anybody know? Uh, quick follow-up. Uh, Tampa Bay. Plops. Plops. There we go. Yes. You mentioned that uh, people forget the role that Adam Levine played in this. So I was wondering if you could explain exactly what role did he play in all of this. Well, we had to have the conversation, right, because there was a lot of talk around Adam Levine's performance in Atlanta. So I think that and, the, and me being vocal about stepping back from performing as well, I think that sparked some of the conversation as well. Thank you. Yeah. I just wonder, because you both talk about um, having these super candid conversations. I wonder if anything that, like asking you this information, anything that Jay offered to you that was surprising or enlightening in terms of his perspective of why he didn't perform or some of the protests that were going on? Well, I think we probably keep some of that. He can speak for himself on, on some of that. I would tell you that in every conversation I've had with Jay, it's been enlightening, mm -hmm. not just on his perspective of the process of how we do the entertainment, but what we should try to achieve. Because we, we always say we can get better and we can evolve, and the Super Bowl halftime has over the years. We, we've always had those moments where we think we can say, let's think about doing this differently. And we always think we should partner with the best. That's why we're sitting here. We're, we're partnering with the best. And so his perspective is going to drive us. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and talk to him about entertainers. He, he knows that business. 
What we have to do is figure out how do we support that and how do we make sure that we bring that to another level. Um, anything surprising yeah, you said? Yeah, just enlightening about his perspective. I just think I, I think that the openness and willingness to, you know, when we presented all these um, initiatives, you know, we expected that maybe do one or two. We thought they would be super powerful as well, as well as we could plug into Inspire Change. And these guys were just super open to, you know, to allow their platform to be used to service others. That was a big surprise. Good surprise. Good surprise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Evans, I'm going to the CNN. So obviously this is coming about in part as a response to protests on the field. And I just want to go back to the question the gentleman from Marketplace was asking earlier. What happens in the interim now? I mean, obviously this is about, as you said, Jay, effective protest. But what happens the next time Somebody protests on the field while this is still underway. Has there been any change in the way that the league is going to deal with that? You said you're asking Jay. Are you asking me? No, no, no. Commissioner, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely not the commissioner yet. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I was worried about. <laughs> I don't want that job. Don't want that job. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, you know, that's, to go back to, that's what we've been talking with our union about for the last year or so in talking about let's, let's one, move forward and work progress, but two, let's do things together. Let's, let's talk about when something needs to, when we need to shine a light on something, let's do it together. And that has been very effective for us. And that's what we talk about all the time, not just with the union, but also with our partners in the player coalition. And we have a group of owners and a group of players who work together, and they meet on a regular basis to talk about those things. A quick follow-up, Jay. With the conversations you have, the frankness and the seemingly open dialogue, I'm sorry to put it this way, but would you, would you kneel or would you stand? Would I what? Would you kneel or would you stand? Um, OK. I think we've passed kneeling. Yeah, I think it's time to go into uh, actionable items. Do you want people to stop it? No, I don't want people to stop protesting at all. Kneeling, I, I, I know we're stuck on it because it's a real thing, but it's a form of protest. I support protests across the board. We need to bring light to the issue. I think everyone knows what the issue is. <laughs> and we, we're done with that. We, 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 everyone knows what the we. You know what the issue is? You know why we were kneeling? OK, do you know the issue? Yeah. yeah, do you know the issue? Yes, we all know the issue now. OK, next, what are we moving on next? And I'm not, again, so to be clear, for the room, I'm not minimizing that part of it, because that has to happen. That's a necessary part of the process. But now we all know what's going on. What are we going to do? How are we going to stop? Because the kneeling was not about a job. It was about injustice. Let me bring attention to injustice. Everyone's saying, how are you going forward if Cap doesn't have a job? This wasn't about him having a job. Yeah. Right? That became part of it. That became part of the discussion. He was kneeling um, to bring attention to injustice. We know what it is. Now, how do we address that injustice? What's the way forward? Does anyone else in here, anyone have any other suggestions of what's the way forward? I agree with that. What commissioner, can Cap get a job? What? Can Colin Kaepernick get a job? Is he being Yeah, involved? and he can sign him right now. Thank you, Court. Hi, Court. I know this is the J of Asia, but who's the first subject for the Inspire Change documentary? I didn't hear, I didn't hear Asia who the Inspire Change. Right. Uh -huh. Hi, Danielle Dalton up at the roof. We'll take suggestions as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the initiatives that was uh, highlighted in the, uh, the real was about police brutality, was about policing a community. So, I'm wondering when you kind of envision what an ideal program or initiative or like what does that look like if you actually build something around community and policing and what would you? 
Well, I'll give you a couple, because I participated in some of those, um, and they've been very effective. What we've actually done, I went down last fall, I believe it was with Kenny Stills and several of the Dolphins, and went into the Miami community, and we actually went with law enforcement into the community and had a couple events. We had the dialogue. We, we shared each other's perspectives, and it was really positive. And I think our players want to do that, to be able to, to show that you know, law enforcement has a role, but the community, they need to understand how the community is looking at the law enforcement also. And that, that dialogue was really helpful. I think it helped the law enforcement from what I did, and I think the community reacted very favorably. And they're doing that all around the country. Uh, I just happened to participate in that one. I also went down to New Orleans, and we went and looked at uh, actually bail reform, and, and actually went to a proceeding with a several places. And out of that, actual change has happened, legislative change, real change. Now, is there more change that needs to happen? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're not there yet. There's, someone made the point. We got a lot of work to do. By getting involved in uh, policing, though, are you, is the NFL, or are you making a statement about how you feel about the current state of policing in this country? No. We're, we're, what we're doing is that we can believe we can make our communities better by sharing perspective. So the community understands law enforcement's perspective, and law enforcement understands the community's perspective, and to understand how we go forward in a better way. Jane, the commissioner, the commissioner answered this question. I want to put it to you as well. Meaningful social change. This is a campaign clearly designed to affect meaningful social change. What does that look like for you specifically? Um, I could paint a utopian uh, version of it. Um, <laughs> it just looks like people respecting each other. People not, um, kids leaving the house and being able to come back home. Um, just normal things that we all expect, uh, respect. And also for officers as well. I think they're going into communities super afraid. That's what I believe. And you police and uh, you can't police people you're afraid of, right? Because then the, there's an overreaction to everything. I talk like this, right? If you don't understand my culture and how I talk, you may think I'm upset. I'm just the way I speak. And if you we're in a we're in a standoff with each other, and you know you're speaking to me in a certain kind of way, my dad left. My dad's not home. My dad died. How about that? And you're talking to me like you're my dad. There's no way I'm gonna allow that. So now my tone changes, and now the 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 communication between us is broken. And that's how I see it. Uh, I, for me, my point of view is the communication between, between us currently is broken. And a lot of people are losing their lives behind it. So to fix that communication, people coming home and being, uh, coming home to their families is the, the and now obviously oh, an overhaul of the jailing system and the way probation and all that, all that works. Um, I guess that's some of the things that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Taking a call, a question right here. Right. Um, Jay, I, I know what you're saying with um, everybody knows what it is now. It's time we move on from the kneeling. But Cap did more than just kneel. I mean, he was working with the communities and he was doing stuff beyond just bringing awareness to it. Why, why don't you bring him into this initiative? Do you plan to involve him? That, you would have to ask him. I can't, I, I don't, I'm not his boss. I can't just bring him into something. He has to, that's, that's for him to say. And you speak about it as if it's in the past tense. You say he, he did more and he oh, was. Still doing it, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, he's, know your huh? No, your rights can't. Yeah, so he's currently doing action items, right? That's, that's his version of action item. This is our version of the action item. We all do different things and we all work differently for the same results. I don't knock what he's doing and. Hopefully, he doesn't uh, knock what I'm doing. Have you talked to him about bringing him into this project? Uh, we, we had a conversation. Is it, is it that's the, that's the further. By the way, we have too. Yeah. Our Players Coalition have, and we have also. Hi, I'm Tatiana with the board. Um, in the music community, have you guys started a conversation with artists to align with the campaign, and what has the response been like? Uh, briefly, yeah, and it's, it's been uh, positive. Yeah. Um, how will that continue? What sort of 
are, are you starting to look for somebody or the five artists to make this song, or what, what does this look like right now? Yeah, we wanted to have this discussion first, and then I think tomorrow we start. We, we've identified artists as well, but I think tomorrow we'll really start moving forward. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Katie from ABC. On the other side of it, there's a ton of players doing great work. Have they been involved in this conversation? And if so, what was their feedback? Did they say, that's great, but you have to do this, that, and the other thing to make sure we can get this work done? Uh, we've really only brought people in uh, in the last 48 hours, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So both Jay and I have had conversations with players and others, including the union. Uh, in the last 48 hours, and I think the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. Is that this is an opportunity? Mm. Can you talk about any of the players specifically? No, but we know, I'm, I'm with Jay in that. When <laughs> she I have asked a, the question. When, when I have a, she actually not expecting an answer. Don't worry about it. She, she's like, <laughs> can she? <laughs> 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 right here on the center. Yeah. Hey, Roger, Dan Kaplan, yeah, the Athletic. Um, you, you mentioned Robert Kraft's role. What about some other owners who, in, in the past, have wanted the focus to be more on the football field and not outside, outside the lines? Well, I, you know, we again, it's not. We've talked about, you know, even in the halftime show. You know, Jay made the point about, you know, we have to improve the quality even of the sound in the stadium. So how do we do that? And so we've had some conversations about that. And I always remind we we still have a football game going on. And, we, and that, you know, that's the, the magic of what all these people back here do is you're putting on an incredible event that is around a football game. Um, we always want the, the uh, focus on football, and I think that's something that we, we do, and we do it very well. But we also want to put the light on things that, you know, I, I think our players care about, our clubs care about, and they do a lot of work in their communities. And so that's not something different to what we do. We just... We get that. We get to a, a game. People want to watch a football game. That's what they, you know, that's what they love doing, and that brings people together. And music, football, entertainment—that's something that we bring people together of all backgrounds and and likes and dislikes. And uh, that's something that's important for us to take advantage of and and use in a powerful way. Can we just stop that and just let everybody talk? We could, we could conclude. You could come over here and sit down, and we could just, if anybody got any other questions. No, no, I'm not. No, by the way, you did a great job. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it, 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 the place where it happened, and you go to the place where it happened, and then you, you have that conversation there. So you think that by a lot of people, like especially people on Twitter, you know, communities, some, it's a lot of criticism. You think that working with the NFL will further bridge the gap? I mean, it's like polarizing. I think about it like this. In the NBA, I don't know, let's call it, 18 years ago, had a player called Mahmoud. You familiar with him? He, a Muslim guy played for the Denver Nuggets. He, um, he, he didn't want to stand up for the national anthem because of his religion. He wasn't playing the next year. Right? So at that time, the, N the NBA was like, oh, everyone's like, ah. If you look today at the NBA the way it is, people would say it's at the forefront of social justice, right? There was a time where it wasn't. So these things happen. People have to evolve, and people have to want to be better, and people have to want to have conversations. And it's come back gradually. You know, once we have the vaccine, that can come back fully. But until then, I expect there are things like vacationing or how much people go out that will be uh, quite 
uh, uh, depressed, but appropriately because we don't want to get back into the situation we're in today where the death numbers are over 2,000 per day. And we're going to have to be incredibly flexible, right? So people who have underlying health conditions or have a family member they live with with underlying health conditions or grandmother who takes care of the two young kids while the single mom in Atlanta goes off to her job, we have to protect that grandmother. So workforces, all kinds of jobs are going to have to be. really flexible about who comes in and who doesn't. And our health is, is our most important thing. And so we have to protect our health while we slowly go back to the economic uh, opportunities that we all have. And we're going to have to take care of families who, you know, their business has gone under, they've lost their job, or they're still struggling to put a meal on the table after the economy starts to slowly open up. Well, I'm hearing your message loud and clear. And Bill, you, you said a vaccine uh, next year, does that mean the economy, you know, you said could fully come back after a vaccine, but that's a long way off. People have to really be ready here for a very slow and gradual return. While, as Melinda says, world and, and right now in this fight. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. Bill and Melinda, great to see you again. I really appreciate you doing this. Thanks for having us. So, Bill, you know, here we are. Um, many people are aware that, that you warned of this in the New England Journal of Medicine and, and during a TED Talk just a couple of years back. I'm curious why you were able to sound the alarm on this and, and why we were still so inadequate in our response in this country. Well, the goal at the time was to get preparedness, to create tools so we'd have quick diagnostics and quick drugs, and that we had done uh, simulations to realize, OK, who's going to take charge? You know, how would we prioritize the testing? Most of that didn't happen. But here we are uh, dealing with it and uh, you know, not as prepared as we'd like to be, but still a lot of good leadership uh, that's allowed us to uh, moderate what could be even worse. Melinda, you have said, you know, as a country, you know, we prepare for war, we prepare for natural disasters. Somehow, we didn't adequately prepare for this. Yeah, and that's surprising. I will say one of the leaders who did think about this early on and take it quite seriously was Chancellor Merkel when she had the G7 and she had the leadership of it. They actually did some simulations and some planning. And we're seeing that Germany is one of the exemplar countries in terms of doing some of the right things. So there is less death in those countries. I wish we had done more of that. There's going to be a lot of time to look back and, and what we could have done better to prepare for this. And hopefully we're all learning lessons in, in real time. But let's let's talk about where we are as a country right now, Bill. What, what should we be doing right now in the middle of the storm? Well, we're still in the very acute phase where strong adherence to this social distancing is absolutely key so that we get to the peak and those numbers really start to come down. And with a month, within a month or so of hitting that peak, uh, if we put in place the right prioritized testing, where you, the right people are tested and they get quick results, and we have contact tracing, then we will uh, be able to start opening up. Uh, but it won't be a totally normal situation until we get a vaccine uh, so that everybody's protected. We've heard a lot from the president about the 30 days of social distancing. That, that takes us to May 1st, which is now just a couple of weeks from now. Do you see a, a possibility of the country reopening in just a couple of weeks, Bill? Well, the numbers should drive us here in a group we fund called uh, International Health and Metrics and Evaluation is showing uh, that the numbers are starting to come down. And so, you know, maybe in late May, uh, you know, we'll have one per 100,000 active cases because you don't want to shut down again. And, you know, the governors have been good leaders. So that dialogue between the experts and the leaders, I think that's happening now. And our foundation is, is part of that dialogue. So what do we need to do uh, right now in order to reopen the country to get back to, you know, some sort of normalcy and, and sort of set a new normal, whatever the new normal is? Well, I, I will say it's three phases. The acute phase we're in now, the semi-normal phase until we get a vaccine, and then the truly normal phase after the vaccine has protected all of us. Uh, that vaccine is probably late 2021. So the semi-normal period, you know, starting whenever it does uh, a month, two months from now, will be quite long. And the idea, you know, is that involve masks, how dense is the seating at restaurants uh, and the testing so that you immediately see if you have that exponential rise in any part of the country and you can go in there and make sure that you isolate and don't get up uh, to a lot of people. We'll go and I have something I want to last thing. I Thank you for flying up. I heard you were busy today. It was a fun day. Yeah. It was exciting. Yeah. Thank you for flying up. I heard you were busy today. It was a fun day. Yeah. It was exciting. Yeah, good, good. I, I, you'll explain Dynamic Island to me later. Uh, if, if I don't understand. It's a great name. It feels like, a, 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 like it should be a reality show. Um, nonetheless, I want to focus on Steve uh, right now. Uh, obviously, these people need no introductions. This is Lorreen um, and Johnny, all well known for being such an important part of, of this journey. So let's start by looking at some clips of Steve Jobs here at Code at, and All Things D. Go ahead. Personal computer has been a pretty amazing thing in that it's morphed into these different things over the years. First it was a hobbyist tool, and then the age of productivity began, and that's what really fueled a lot of the growth. But then the internet came along. 
all of a sudden, the next great age of the personal computer started. We feel very strongly at Apple that there's a third great age of the personal computer coming. It's where the, the personal computer becomes sort of the, your digital hub. It's becoming the hub for your photography, your movies, your music, obviously. It's integral to our digital lifestyle. No plans at the current time to make a tablet. <laughs> I think the digital hub has been a resurgence of, of relevance for the PC. Our retail stores went from zero to a billion faster than anyone's ever done it before. Faster than really? Yeah. Are you losing money on those stores? No, we're making money. The third business we're about to get in is... We're about to have a phone. About to have a phone. I have no idea. Oh, I'll send you one. Thanks. Yeah. Best iPod we've ever made, by the way. Best phone we've ever made, too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> we've really revolutionized how you use a cell phone. If it was nothing but a cell phone, it'd be really successful. It's the internet in your pocket for the first time. Generally, we were both the youngest guys in the room. And now, I'm the oldest guy in the room most of the time. And um, that's why I love being here. And... <laughs> Eve is so known for his restraint. <laughs> I have one of the best jobs in the world. I'm incredibly lucky I to hang around some of the most wonderful, brightest, committed people I've ever met in my life. And together, we get to play in the best sandbox I've ever seen and try to build great products for people. That's what keeps me going. And it's what kept me going five years ago. It's what kept me going 10 years ago when the doors were almost closed. And it's what will keep me going five years from now, whatever happens. You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. That's great. That was, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that was his last interview. I think it was just before he died. Um, so let's talk about the current moment. I would love each of you to reflect on how, uh, you can't guess what he was gonna think or anything else, but what Steve would think of the current moment in your estimation, again, we don't know, obviously. Um, Tim, why don't we start with you? The, the current moment at Apple or the current well, moment in the world? In the world at Apple? Oh, I think at Apple, uh, I believe and hope that he would be proud over a day like this where we bring out a lot of innovations that um, are very much on the principles that he laid out and articulated so well. Uh, I think the, the greater world he would be uh, troubled by a, a lot of things that he sees, the sort of the part, partisanship and, and the division in the world. And, and, uh, but I think he would be happy that we're living up to the values that he talked about so much, like privacy, uh, like protecting the environment. Uh, these were, were core to him while we're keeping up innovation and, and uh, trying to give people something that uh, enables them to do something they couldn't do otherwise, to, to give them tools to, to discover their own self and to change the world in their own way. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, so I think it would be mixed. Uh, but I, and I hate to project right. kind of what he would think today. I really don't like to do that. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, we, there are lots of challenges in the world today. Mm -hmm. Laurie? Mm. Um, it's true that this is, this, that's an impossible hypothetical, but because we, we knew him so very well for a long time. Um, in, in many ways, he inhabits each of us. And for me, uh, a, often the way I make sense of the world, I have sort of, you know, the resonance of his voice in my head often. Um, he would be very disappointed with the political climate. I would say. Um, not only the polarization, not only the fact that people are really um, coming to blows 
you know, within families and communities in our country, but also just that he loved our country so much. He loved California so much, but he loved our country. He loved the idea of America. He loved what it allowed the individual and the communities to become. Um, he loved the unfetteredness of it. He, he loved the personal freedoms and liberties, but also the connectedness and responsibility for each other. It was very important to him to be able to give something back to the human experience. And I think he, he, would, be, he would not be quiet <laughs> about the Would he be on Twitter? Would he be on Twitter? No. I, I mean, he wasn't a big fan of social media, um, it, mainly because of the business model. Mm -hmm. um, but he would that someday we will be able to make machines that. But I had a hard time getting the management team to agree that they should uh, acquire Google. I think he's saying that they were having a hard time going to 350 and we were having a hard time changing our number. Yeah, that, they felt they didn't need it. Uh, but, you know, I, I start here for one very simple reason. There are many, many instances where things could have gone either way. And I'm really glad they didn't acquire because the world might have been a very, very different place. Looking back in retrospect, I feel like it would have been really, really sad if, in fact, uh, Larry and Sergey had sold the company and not pursued the vision and changed the way the world the way they have. So uh, I've it's, it's actually kind of an interesting story because the reason we didn't sell it is not so much the money. I mean, like I don't know, really, grad students, you know, eating burritos or whatever. So like a million dollars was fair amount. Um, the reason I think we really didn't sell the company was that we talked to all the search companies at the time and they just weren't interested in what we're doing. And so and it was obviously like didn't want to buy like you know this company that didn't really have anything without the people. So they wanted us, but like we were like, well, why are we going to work at this place that doesn't believe in search? You know, it's not going to cause anything good to happen. So then ultimately, we didn't sell for that reason, just because they weren't interested in it, which is the same reason they whatever, had trouble getting to a million dollars, which I guess at the time was a lot of money. Um, but, uh, but I think ultimately for me, it was just about wanting to actually, you know, search seemed pretty important. It was about actually wanting to do something in that area, and it didn't seem like that was going to happen in these organizations. Yeah. You know, it's amazing when the business people take over how rational they get focused on short-term revenue and lose the long-term vision. Um, that's a good place to kick off on a different point. Uh, there's a, most companies end up in failure, and I'm not talking about just the startups, but if you look at the S&P 500, so many of the very large companies Mark, I got to be honest, not long ago, I was thinking we may be doing this as like a post fight interview in Las <laughs> Vegas, right outside of the octagon after you're, you get out of a fight with Elon. Maybe next year. Maybe next not, year. Not, not, not Elon, but, okay, but someone. I want to keep competing, but I just need to find someone. Do you think he was ever serious about fighting? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. But I don't know. I mean, this is like a thing that I, I just, I really enjoy doing as a sport. So. Yeah. Um, so for me, there's a sort of level of, like it's, it's, it's competition, it's a, it's a sport. And um, so I, mean, I, I love doing it. I, I train with a bunch of, a bunch of guys and you know, I definitely want to compete more. But well, you see, are there any other tech CEO rivals you would want to fight if you could? Or no, kind I, think of more fun, I think it'd be more fun to fight someone who, who actually fights. Take it seriously. Yeah. 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 So this yeah. is like their, yeah. So settling you know, tech business robberies by combat, you don't think that's going to become like a thing now? I think, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I think that's not generally the direction that our society is heading. Um, probably for the, for the best. Probably is yeah. for the best. Um, I think a little bit of a, of a channel to get some aggression out is, is good. And I think, yeah. I, I think the, 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 the one that was proposed with Elon could have been fun, but it's okay. Well, I guess what I'm saying is like, if he told you, if he came back to you and said, I'll find on your terms, you pick the venue, would you, would you still do it? I, I, just, I, don't, I don't think it'll happen. Okay. I don't think it'll happen. Okay. Fair. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just think that it's like there's sort of a valorization where people look at the stuff and are like, oh, I could do that. But I mean, it's, you have to train. You know? yeah. it's, like, you wanna, it's, it's like, it's very technical. It's very fun. Yeah. Very intellectual. I mean, I used to, when I was um, a lot younger, I used to fence competitively. Mm -hmm. And the, like a lot of the striking aspects, I mean, obviously it's different because I'm fencing, you're playing for points, right? Mm -hmm. So you, when you get a touch, it's, you know, the point is and the sequence is done. Whereas, you know, here you have to worry about being countered and all that. But it's, um, I know, it's very intellectual. I, I, just, I used to, I really enjoyed, you know, thinking about all the different combos and moves and all that. And there's a, a period where we were ramping up and like learning all the basic stuff before you can really like get to the intellectual part of it. But mm -hmm. once you're there, it's, I don't know, it's super fun. I love doing it with friends. And it's so your mind doesn't just like shut off when you're doing it. Like yeah. you actually find it to be mentally yeah. stimulating. Yeah. Interesting. Last year when Elon was close to taking over Twitter, I asked you for, if you had any advice for him, I'm not gonna ask you to give him advice this time, but a lot has changed in a year. You've got threads now um, mm -hmm. out and I'd love to get into why you did threads when you did and the approach that you took and kind yeah. of when you made that decision. Cause it seemed like it happened pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, I've always thought that the, I think the aspiration of Twitter, right, to build this you know, text-based discussion should be a billion-person social app. I mean, there, there are certain kind of fundamental social experiences that you know, I look at them and I'm just like, okay, like if, if I were running that, I could scale that to, to reach a billion people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why over time we've, we've done different acquisitions and why we've considered them. Is, you know, I've looked at different products. I'm like, okay, yeah, I think that, that is like yeah. something really good there. We can get that to be a billion people. You um, tried to buy Twitter way back in the day, right? Like many, yeah. many years ago. Yeah, yeah. and we, we had conversations. I think this was 
gosh, this was like, I think when Jack was leaving the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I get it. I mean, different entrepreneurs have different goals for what they want to do. And some people want to run their companies independently. And that's cool. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's good that there's sort of a diversity of different outcomes. But I guess Twitter was sort of plodding along for a while uh, before Elon came. And I think the rate of change in the product was pretty slow, right? So it just didn't seem like they were on the trajectory that would maximize their potential. And then with Elon coming in, I think there was certainly an opportunity to change things up. And he has, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's definitely a change agent, yeah. right? And, um, and uh, it's, I think it's still not clear exactly what trajectory it's on. Um, but I do think he's been pretty polarizing. So I think that the, the chance that it sort of reaches the, the full potential on the trajectory that it's on is, I, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'm probably less optimistic. I just think there's less of a chance now than there was before. Mm. Um, but I guess just watching all this play out, it just kind of reminded me and you know, rekindled the sense that like someone should build a, a version of this that can, um, that can be more ubiquitous. And you know, look at some of the things around it. Like, um, I think these days people just want kind of a, well, let's, let's put it this way. I think a lot of the conversation around social media is around sort of like information and the utility aspect. But I think an equally important part of designing any product is how it makes you feel. Right? What's the kind of emotional charge of it and, mm-hmm. and how do you come away from that feeling? And um, I think Instagram is generally kind of on the happier end of the spectrum. I think Facebook is sort of in the middle because it has happier moments, but then it also has sort of harder news and things like that that I think tend to just be more critical and maybe you know, make people see some of the negative things that are going on in the world. And I think Twitter indexes very strongly on just being quite negative and critical. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, I think that's sort of the design. It's not that the designers wanted to make people feel bad. I think they wanted to have like maximum kind of intense debate, right? Which I think that that, that sort of creates a certain emotional feeling and load. And I just thought you could create a discussion experience that um, that wasn't quite so negative or, or toxic. And, um, and I think in doing so, it would actually be more accessible to a lot of people. I think a lot of people just don't want to use an app where they come away feeling bad all the time. Right? I think that there's a certain set of people who either tolerate that because it's their job to get that access to information or they're just warriors <laughs> in that way. Yeah. Right? They, like, they want to be part of that kind of intellectual combat. Yeah. But I, just, I don't think that that's the ubiquitous thing. Right. I think the, the ubiquitous thing is like people want the they want to get fresh information. I think there's a place for text-based. Right? Even, even when the world is you know, moving towards richer and richer forms of, of sharing and, and consumption, I think the text isn't, isn't going away. It's still going to be a big thing. But, but I think how people feel is really important. So that's been a big part of how we try to emphasize and develop threads. And you know, over time, you know, if you want it to be ubiquitous, you, um, you, know, you obviously want to be welcome to everyone. But, but I think how you see the networks and the culture that you create there, I think ends up being pretty important for how they scale over time. Or with Facebook, you know, we started with this real name culture. And it was mm-hmm. grounded to your college email address. And you know, now it obviously hasn't been grounded to your college email address for a very long time. But, but I think the, the, um, the kind of real um, authentic identity aspect of Facebook has continued and, and continued to be an important part of it. So I think how we set the culture for threads early on in terms of being a more positive, friendly place for discussion will hopefully be one of the defining elements for you know, the next decade as we, as we scale it out. We obviously have a lot of work to do. But, um, but I'd say it's, it's off, to a, uh, off to a quite a good start. I mean, yeah. um, obviously there's the huge spike, and then right. you know, everyone who, who tried out originally is going to stick around immediately. But I mean, the monthly actives and weeklies, I, mean, I don't think we're stats on it yet, but, but it's, it's good. No, I mean, I feel, I feel quite good about, like about, um, about that. Because there's been reporting out there that engagement kind of, which I think is natural with any spike like that, yeah. engagement's not going to sustain. You yeah. guys kind of set, I think, the original industry standard on engagement for these kind of products, so I assume you're guiding towards a similar kind of metric. That yeah, you... we just have this playbook for how we do this. Yeah. And there's like, phase one is build a thing that kind of sparks some joy and that people appreciate. Then from there, you want to get to something that is retentive. So mm-hmm. people who have um, a good experience with the thing come back um, and, and want to keep using it. And those two things are not, not always the same. A lot of, there are a lot of things that people think are awesome, but may not you know, always come back to. And I think you know, some of what people are seeing now around like chat GPT is part of that. It's like, I mean, this is like, like, this level of AI is, it's like a miracle, right? It's awesome, but it doesn't mean that everyone's going to use case every week, right? right. So, so I think that there's first is like create the spark. Second is create the retention. Then once you have retention, then you can start um, encouraging more people to join. But if, there, if people aren't going to be retained by it, why would you ask people to go sign up for something, right? Um, so kind of step one, spark. Step two, retention. Step three, growth and scaling the community. And then only at that point is step four, which is monetization. Mm-hmm. And, and we can we take a while to go through all those. I mean, we're really in, in some sense only getting started on the monetization of um, the messaging experiences like WhatsApp now with stuff like business messaging. But wow. two, two billion people use the product every day, right? right. So I mean, we, we like we scale it pretty far. Um, but I think with our model that that sort of works. So to, well, to really, I, don't, I mean, I know you're saying you want to not necessarily you are competing with Twitter, but you're trying to do it differently. To me, as a Twitter addict for way too long and a very early Threads user, and I've been seeing similar feedback from others when like Adam has been asking for feedback on Threads, is that it kind of still lacks that real time feeling when you first open it of like mm-hmm. I'm going to be getting fresh, you know, because like what's like Twitter for is news. Yeah. I know you guys aren't necessarily trying to emphasize news in this for experience, which is a whole other topic really, but like how do you get that kind of Twitter like this is what's going on right now feeling? I don't know if you Yeah, no, I think I think it's a thing that will work on improving. But I mean hard news content isn't the only fresh content. Sure. I think even within news, there's a whole spectrum between sort of hard critical news and like people understand what's going on with the sports that they follow right. or you know, the celebrities that they follow or things like that. And you know a lot of those things don't kind of leave people with the same it's not like as cutting, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of the kind of hard news, and especially the political discussion. I think it's just so um it's so polarized. Yeah. yeah, I think it's hard to come away from reading news about politics these days feeling good. Yeah. Right? So I, I think that that's but that doesn't go for everything. And part of this overall is just how you tune the algorithm mm-hmm. to um to basically encourage either recency mm-hmm. or quality but less recency. So I'm not sure that we have that balance exactly right yet. It may be the case that in a product like Threads where you are where people may want to see more recent content as opposed to something like an Instagram or Facebook where it's more visual and the balance might just be towards um you know balancing towards maybe a little more quality even if it's you know mm-hmm. 12 hours ago instead of two hours ago. Mm-hmm. So I think this is the type of stuff that we need to tune and, and, and kind of optimize. But um, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. This hasn't happened yet with Threads, but you're eventually going to hook it into ActivityPub, which is this decentralized social media protocol. Um, yeah. It's kind of complicated in layman's terms, but essentially people run their own servers. So instead of having a centralized company run the whole network, people can run their own fiefdoms. It's federated. Yeah, so Threads cool. will eventually hook into this. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time you've done anything, I think, really meaningful in the decentralized social media space. Yeah, we're building it from the ground up. So yeah. I mean, I've, I've always believed in this stuff. I mean, yeah, a lot really? of this hasn't. Yeah, I mean, you run the largest centralized social media. But it did exist when, when yeah. we got started, right? And I think the project of like, I mean, I've had our team at various times do the thought experiment of like, all
the more that there's interoperability between different services and the more content can flow, the better all the services can be. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just confident enough that we can build the best one of the services that I actually think that will benefit and, and are, will be able to build better quality products by our products making sure that we can have access to all of the different content um, from wherever anyone is creating it. And like, I get that not everyone's going to use everything that we build. I mean, that's, that's obviously the case. And it's like, okay, we have 3 billion people using Facebook, but like, you know, not everyone wants to use one product. And I think the making it so they can use an alternative but can still interact with people on the network will make it so that that product also is more valuable. That you can increase the quality of the product by making it so that you can give people access to all the content even if it wasn't created on the network itself. Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's bad. Yeah. Um, I think it takes some confidence. Um, but, but I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's both good to give people choice. I don't know. There's, there's kind of this funny counterintuitive thing where I just don't think that people like feeling locked into a system. Yeah. So in a way, I actually think people will feel better about using our products if they know that they have the choice to leave, mm. right? And, and like, and, and if we make that super easy to, to happen, and obviously there's a lot of competition, and you know, I mean, it's, we do download your data on all our products, and like, it's you know, people can do that today. But like, but it's you know, the more that that's designed in from scratch, um, I think it really just gives you know, creators, for example, the sense that okay, like I'm not, it's, I have a agency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, in a way, that actually makes people feel more confident investing in the system if they know that they have freedom over how they mm. they operate. So I don't know. I, I think like it's maybe for phase one of social networking, it was fine to like have these systems that people felt a little more locked into. But I think for the mature state of the ecosystem, I, I don't think that that's going to be where it goes. So I'm pretty optimistic about this. And then if we can build threads on this, then you know, maybe. Maybe we can over time, um, you know, as the standards get more built out, it, it's possible we can spread that to more of the stuff that we're doing. Um, we're certainly working on interoperable with messaging. Yeah. And I think that that's been an important thing. The first step was kind of getting interrupt to work between our different messaging systems. Right. So and you can talk to, to each other. You can... Yeah. And then the first the first decision there was okay, well, WhatsApp, you know, we have this very strong commitment to encryption. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to interrupt, then we're